for those who live under the rock. Would you please introduce yourself, Simon? I'll try. So, yeah, my name is Simon. I'm uh, Simon Holmdahl. I'm a Swedish designer director uh, who's lived here in the UK now for 11 years. Um, I worked for a big chunk of my career. I worked for a company called Members Machine. And now uh, I'm a co-owner of a studio called Panoply, uh, also in London. And... Uh, yeah, we've, I've been there now for three and a half years, I think. I don't know, time kind of like becomes a little bit blurry. So a little bit over a decade now. Definitely getting old. I, you know. I found out who you are in your man versus machine years. Most people probably associate you with uh, Nike yeah. abstract stuff because it's quite uh, iconic and it got torn apart for references. Literally half of the industry tries to copy you, mate your style and my admiration of your art is really rare combination of tech capacity and designer eye you know in mm. one person uh, that kind of is the story behind members machine it was kind of like their philosophy too you know being you know merging that the you know good designer with three like really high-end 3d people and that's kind of how it's how i guess that's how i was schooled in a way mm. members machine is a very different place now uh, than it was then, but it was a very, very good like upbringing for me, <laughs> so to speak, yeah. Yeah, through to, into the industry. And it's kind of like what we're doing now with Panoply. We're like we think ourselves as kind of a SEAL team of designers that do high-end three D and stuff. But we're like we 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 never put up like barriers of what can be what's possible. You know, it's like and I know you you have a similar mentality. I think it's the future, isn't it? Smaller teams and like more with a lot of firepower. <laughs> you guys are full remote still. Yes, and we intend on staying that way. We feel like it's the future. I mean, it's it's always, we've all done that thing where you work with people remotely over Dropbox and you're waiting for stuff to sync and you end up sending stuff alongside it because you don't want to wait for the sync to come through. Yeah, All of that stuff is such a pain. So through like a remote you know, infrastructure with Taradici, it allows you to kind of actually not worry about sending files back and forth. You have all your infrastructure in one place and everyone accesses it. It's like you physically are in one Yes, studio. even though you're s spread out over, yeah, with the even di over different countries. I mean, it works okay. Like, if I work from here, if our data center is here in the UK, which it is, and I will go to Sweden, where I'm from, uh, I would get another, I would probably have a delay of 30 milliseconds. Hmm. What difference does that make? <laughs> it doesn't really make a difference. And the way it handles it as well is like the input, the mouse input or the Wacom input or whatever you use is calculated locally. So you, you don't feel the lag when you click stuff. Around. I, I uh, haven't tried Teradici, but I heard they even support stuff like 3D mices. No idea, and but stuff. it wouldn't, I know, I know they support Wacoms, although Simon doesn't listen to me. He doesn't want to try to I would, As I said, I would love to try it. I just uh, just haven't. It's not as something that I've been oh, every day thinking like, oh, I wish I could navigate through my 3D scenes. Yeah, I'm telling you. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm on the same vibe as you regarding the remote workflow. I think it's future. And if not fully remote, then it should, remote workflow should be really flexible and achievable. I for mean, most companies in general if we're looking at it on a broader like how the evolution of rendering has happened over the years i mean with the introduction of gpu renderers like we can now render stuff on one gpu that we would have taken when i first started at man b we would have had like i mean i can see what you got here i mean you have a lot of beautiful machines here the render power of one gpu now is probably like that gpu which is a pretty badass gpu crazy i mean that's probably equivalent to what we had in the entire studio versus CPU power when I started at Man This so is I mean, probably four 1080 Ti's. You see? Similar. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. So, I mean, think about that. So, all, all this means is that you can do a lot more with a lot less people and a lot less hardware than before. It's cheaper and the tools are getting better. Knowledge are kind of spreading and People are, I, I don't know, it's just maturing a lot. And yeah. I feel like small teams 
high talented teams can execute stuff now that years ago, a few years ago, would have been considered something that a big studio would do. Where that's just no one can deny that. Would, would you would you do the switch if not for COVID? Yes. Yes, we, we were thinking about it anyway due to Brexit. Because ah. a lot of people, well, a lot of people that would, um, we would have worked with before decided to leave the UK. We had ah. and, and stuff. And, you know, we, I know a lot of friends back home in Sweden and, and around Europe that we like to work with. And in the past, we would have uh, bought them fl uh, flight tickets and they would have to come here and stay with us. And like, why though? really like we could just let them be where they are and yeah. then also the schedule like being able to work when suits each person you know in the team like obviously if we have meetings we have to be there for you know at the same time but other than that as long as the job gets done i'm happy to take advantage of the fact that we're remote and be able to work during the times that suit you you know and so. probably plan your day as you wish you know yeah exactly i mean as long as you have a decent connection or not a terrible one. I mean, I tried it even on a 4G connection because before we moved, I just had a 4G browser, yeah. that's all I had. And even with that, I was like pretty convinced that, damn, this could work. And you know, I wouldn't recommend doing that on a 4G connection because you at the mercy of the <laughs> yeah. cellular providers and they are gonna screw you over. So. so here in this video, I'm rolling some of Simon's best works over the years. And it's funny because it's, it's basically industry's best inspiration in, in the category of, I don't even know how to describe it, abstract, super hyper-realistic stuff. This amazing quality is achievable with really minimal resources. The guys have very few people, very few machines and work remotely. What's, what's your current setup in terms of hardware? We've gone down, since we moved to full remote, we sold off a lot of our old equipment. We used to have 10, 15 machines, yeah. all with multiple GPUs and stuff. Uh, a lot of Xeons, Xeons with, you know, a lot of cores and stuff. But yeah, we're down to two Threadripper machines currently, like really high-end ones with 256 gigs of RAM and yeah. three GPUs each. And then we have like one rack-mounted they're all rack mounted, but we have one, you know, GPU machine with eight cards. And then we rent in additional machines when we have, you know, we have, we, we have constant rentals that we have using, but it's quite cost effective. And especially now with the, the global GPU shortage, it's kind of, Oh yeah. <laughs> so we, we've been relying a lot on rentals lately, but we are looking at upgrading our GPUs to the new Quadro. But it's crazy inspirational for me that you have like, it's a huge budget looking stuff you're doing with not as uh, many like resources, which means you're a genius in optim optimizing it. Because I tried to, to, to do similar stuff mm. in, in Houdini and it's crazy. I, I mean, it's I all know. part of the process. It's not like we're designing stuff and then figuring out how to optimize it. We're mm. designing with the optimization in mind from the start. But it took a lot of years for you to it's just the way ma master that. I guess so. I mean, but I don't see it as any different part of my workflow than because, mm -hmm. like, I when I initially start on something, I have an intuition of where I'm heading with it, and I know that what my different solutions can be initially, because knowing that there are limitations on what you can do with the RAM on the GPUs, etc., and just making it feasible, you know, with there there are. I pull a lot of inspiration from the games industry in a way because they use you know a lot of baking and texture based stuff so that's kind of what we do too is that we use it slightly differently we don't have to optimize to the same extent but we still can take that as a kind of hint and lead lead us yeah. to kind of create different types of effects and instancing and stuff like that there's a lot of you know tricks. that's cool <laughs> some time ago i asked you vax or wops you said wops you're not using oh, yeah. legs that much. Would you say that now it's also cops? Cops and wops. Cops is still wops though. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, you have cop wops. 
cough wipes. <laughs> you have, you probably have Vex cups as well, or whatever they call Wrangle lock cups. Yeah, so Simon was kind enough to uh, give me like friendly tips. I wanted to switch full time to Houdini, and I just, I just can't, can't do it. And then Simon, because you're previously C4D user as well. Oh, hardcore! I wouldn't. It took me a long time to convince myself to switch to Houdini too. So I, I think I. It was either in one of your interviews or, or I found it myself on your Vimeo, mm. your, your old Cinema 4D stuff. Yeah. You tried to do Houdini stuff in Cinema 4D. I kind of, yeah. And that's I probably kind of when you started to explore what else is there. It's funny, it's my business partner, Mark, he's the guy who got me into Houdini. He was a, we were both working at Man V at the time and he was a freelancer. And he's he'd been like harassing me over the years to like, Look at it. So you came to Man vs. Machine as a Cinema 4D artist? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Dude, when I came there first, I was the only person using Cinema. What they were, were using, they using Maya and 3 Max. Okay, old school. And I kind of converted them to Cinema after a few of the previous key people. When they left, we kind of re internally restructured it around Cinema. And they're still using Cinema now, but I think this... And then Houdini as well. Now. What I think is quite important is getting a good understanding of shape language and hierarchies in, in the visual yeah. realm. Because uh, I think you can get away with a lot of simple stuff if your fundamental hierarchies of your visual yeah, that that that, right. that was a really good tip you gave me. Like get comfortable with uh, basically day-to-day -day tasks in Houdini and then go from there don't I, I i'm the opposite i'm doing it wrong i'm i'm doing like i'm gonna do the the most epic simulation right now it's but you're gonna, a vfx guy yeah it's it gonna sense. look epic <laughs> and it it will and it will I, it's uh, just you know it's just being aware of like always being critical of what what is the most important thing on screen and you know and putting your efforts where they actually m matter you know the Courses by uh, Stephen Nipping, yeah, Applied Houdini. Yeah, yeah. I seriously watched all of them like maybe five times each. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not lying. I'm not exaggerating. But that's how you do it. That's how you learn anything, right? I'm still, I still like when I finish a chapter or a topic, move to another one. If I'll tr try to do something from the previous one, mm. from my head, I don't remember. Anything. I know. I know. That's how it is. When you begin, yeah? that's how it is. When you begin, and then it becomes second nature. That there is nothing wrong about me. No, then. no, it's just normal. Okay, that's <laughs> that, that's good to know. <laughs> and this one is COVID related. Did it change anything about you as a person? I mean, COVID. Yeah, yeah. But maybe you became super introverted. I've always been introvert. Yeah. So it's fine. I've actually kind of enjoyed it in a weird way. <laughs> you know, I shouldn't say I've enjoyed it, but it it's definitely not. I, I think I've suffered less than a lot of other people maybe yeah. from this. Cause a, a lot of people think I'm extrovert actually because I do public speeches and all that stuff, but it's actually far from truth. Th truth. truth yeah. I'm, I'm super introverted. And yeah, COVID was not as painful for me as well, but it, it was for my missus. She's extrovert. She loves city life, going to restaurants and all that stuff. That was a big hit for her. No, I mean, we even, I mean, we even moved further out. We live in London, but we moved a little bit further out mm. during the pandemic. We stay, we're planning on staying there a little bit, partly because we have better internet where we live now, but also because there's no point in living in, the, in a really trendy area when everything is closed and there's no point. Yeah, yeah. You're not going to see your friends anyway. What's the point? No, 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 for sure. I mean, it, it's definitely not fun. And I think it's changed us all to some extent. It certainly accelerated our, our kind of move into the remote. And I think yeah. it re accelerated everything. Like clients, clients are more used to the idea of remote yeah, workers. In, and in out of nothing, we were the same. We were actually, my partner was really keen to have people around, team together and all that stuff. And I was always like, can I work from home? <laughs> thing is, what you find is that you're going you're gonna to end up working more when you're at home anyway. Exactly. We found so that you people are actually people. more productive when they can control their own schedule. They don't have commute exactly. times, which in UK may be crazy. So that's the thing as well. Like, even if you add up the tiny bit of lag that you kind of forget about after about five seconds of a remote connection, like, 
you're saving maybe an hour, maybe two hours, if you're, or maybe more, mm. if you live far away from your office, every day. That shit does up. What lag though? With it's not lag, but you know, you have. There is a certain latency. Well, there wasn't almost no latency it's with Parsec. The space it is supposed no, to be. No, but better. I know, but it, you can still sense that it's not oh, under yeah. your desk. That's all I'm saying. And the quality is not the and same. And the quality, the quality is kind of the same, roughly. Versus ter Teradici. Oh no, no, Teradici is better than Porsche for that. Yeah. Okay, remote, remote work. Yeah, all that. We're back. I'm with the coffee. Something happened. Which we should, should not be mentioned. No, we should have a person actually checking our cameras. Yeah. Normal. Mm. I hear ya. So, yeah. co COVID. It's all COVID's fault. Yeah, we mm. blame COVID. So, Cinema 4D. <coughs> so, you switched? Yes. You're not using it? No. At all? C completely gone? Basically not. Every time I have been forced to go into it for whatever reason, I'm reminded of why I'm not there. Yeah. It's uh it's a struggle. It's it, once you go to it, you, know, you can't really go back. And I guess the nature of the art you're doing does not require any modeling, that kind of stuff. Uh, no, not much. But I mean, even if for the type of modeling I would do, it's kind of a bit ropey, a lot of bullying, <laughs> you know. Oh, uh, volumes and stuff, and it's Oppo commercial. Yes, the one that's raising from mm -hmm. the sand. Oh my God, mate. Remember, I was saying everyone's copies you. It I was saw, rep I it saw was replicated I saw like a few copies. Of yeah. yeah, that was funny. That was one of my first projects on at Panoply that, that we did. You know, the environment at the beginning as well. There's no displacement at all. It's all instancing, all geometry. Just like and Ratchet. Yeah, yeah. Ratchet was perfect for that project because it was so much, you know, fog and atmospherics that it's so much more easily controllable than. That's that's one thing I just adore about Redshift, that light contribution to volumes, absolutely that, amazing. That and also the directionality of the lights, yeah. that stuff is something that this they claim to have implemented in Octana. It's not really the same thing. You know, it, uh, Clarice have it. Oh, I bet. And it's unboxed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's basically Redshift. Mixed with octane. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like Arnold. With no too, limits. To be honest. Crazy. Arnold is a similar story. In but a way. it's probably much, much slower than Corey's. Is it? Yeah, I don't know. The only difference. Arnold is slow, but it is getting the, you know, the GPU. They have the GPU support. So oh, do they now? Yeah. Okay. But we've had, we tested it a little bit because we've been looking, we also looked at the V-Ray uh, for Houdini. Oh and my was, God, no. Yeah, that's what we found out too. It wasn't really, it wasn't really implemented good enough. It was very crashy and I uh, had problems with both Arnold and, and V-Ray when we tried it. The CPU part was fine, but the GPU one was a bit janky at best and some, a lot of the shaders weren't supported. So we ended up reverting back to what we knew, you know, relation to Octane stuff, even though it's not perfect. Mm. Did you ever want to create, like, for example, me as an artist, mm. I'm realistic environments, all that kind of stuff, no abstract or motion graphic stuff at all, whereas you are the, you're setting up trends in those hyper-realistic mm. phenomenons happening. My business partner used to call them physics effects and was referencing your work all the time. Did you ever want to create more of a uh, replicating real world scenarios rather than abstract stuff? Uh, no, I, I don't really think about what, like when the, when a project or when I'm thinking of a project, I just do whatever comes natural to me. I feel I never really set out to make it abstract or, or real world specific but I want to be able to make it feel relatable in some way that you can kind of sense the Fe feel the texture yeah and there's stuff. a tactile nature to it and also I wanted to whether it's in the movement or the behavior or whatever I'm creating it always has something that you deep down will kind of be able to relate to in mm. its motion or in its behavior qualities because every design I make generally and w that we do as well kind of have it's not random, 
you know it, even though it's abstract it's it looks that way because it has structure underlying that makes it what it is because it's built through evolution well actually your stuff is realistic as it, it is mm. it's probably more of a macro world mm. yeah sort in of. some cases we've yeah. done some stuff that are like landscapes too in not to just to in a traditional sense necessarily um, and we have some projects that we worked on recently we can't really talk about yet that's some annoying NDAs. <laughs> but you know it's it's the way it is it's i'm interested in it i'm interested in the kind of larger scale too but when i end up creating stuff the stuff that that comes natural happens to be the stuff that we make you know it's yeah. Which leads me to question, do you reference any real world phenomenon or is it just in your head and, and you just you just reference your own feelings? Mm. I mean, definitely reference real world stuff for sure, but we, it, it's not literal like, here's the reference, I'm going to recreate it. It's kind of like, oh, I like this part of this and I like this part of this and this part of this and then I kind of took take them as ingredients mm -hmm. and I cook something up from it, you know. Yeah. It's kind of like, in, you know, I think we all do that to some extent, but it depends on who you ask. Some people see references as purely a visual and they try to replicate it as closely as they can. I look at hierarchies mm -hmm. within, within, within reference, whether it's distribution of detail or textual distributions or, or just shapes and forms and then think about what makes me feel what I feel about, you know, Mm -hmm. certain plants or whatever it is you know it has the leaves that have that kind of sense of calmness to it and fragile nature it might have a more deeply rooted root system that has a very different visual aesthetic and and it's boiling down what that makes me feel and then reimagining what the actual leaves and the stem is yeah in an abstract way that's kind of how I internalize it and that's kind of a one example but it can be anything and it's it, it comes down to to shape language and here it is and, and I talk I think a lot about that and where do you that's one of the stupid questions but <laughs> it's no stupid question. where do you take inspiration from because your works when you look at it they they do leave goosebumps it's so just because the technical execution is so flawless it you instantly believe in it, like those symmetric, is it liquidy. Oh, I hear about size. Yeah, it, it's so it just hypnotizes you literally. Yeah, it's. I'm really interested in taking natural simulations and altering the coordinate space or whatever. Like, take say we think of gravity as something yeah. always pointing down, but we're working with computers we can kind of make it local localized and be able to bend gravity in any direction you want so you can have stuff flowing in super geometric patterns and we create a kind of intersection point of geometric and organic and artificial but yet natural you know it's that's the stuff that really gets me excited so the, the fact that you can kind of bend yeah, and you Real it's like it's like a curiosity. How would it look if I did this in my mind? I love the way it looks, but how can I make it a bit different than something you can shoot on a camera? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, uh, why would I? Why why recreate something? Why okay, that's something interesting. New? That's kind of where I come from. Yeah, that's something that drives me as well. That's something that inspires me. The fact that I kind of have that knowledge to do that, and then you try to explore what actually you can do. Yeah. Whereas others many actually people they answer well i'm getting inspired from the summer rain and things like I that i think we all share the same inspiration like in a lot of ways like we're all inspired by nature because how can you not be like mm. nature is the best it's creator right i really like uh, thunderstorms mm -hmm. in the summer i prefer to open windows and hear it but not these days because my little one is afraid i mean in this studio you don't even need to open anything <laughs> Sound is soundproofing. I mean, you can hear the birds. It's quite peaceful. 
Uh, but it's really nice actually being able to sit on here, birds singing while yeah. working. It's like a nice fusion of. We, we won't disclose the location of this. No, place. this is an undisclosed location. <laughs> so R and D process. Even uh, amateur like me knows that to get some sort of effect, you have to do like tens, hundreds iterations of each mm. thing to make it look like you wanted to. How many times is it in your case in average? Yeah, it's impossible to answer like one. Yeah, it's always seven times. You know, it's not like <laughs> it's not as simple as that. But I mean, I would say that it's something that I do take very seriously. I, I feel like iterating on that stuff. Sometimes you have stuff that just like pops straight away. You yeah, know? you know that feeling when you know everything comes easy, and other times it's it's a struggle, and you have to keep iterating okay, well, until. I'll, I'll put that question in a stupid section. It's nothing wrong with the question, <laughs> but it's. Uh, you know, it's it's a difficult one to answer. But there are commercial projects and there are your personal pieces, which you can do for whatever five years if you want to. For me, like the personal pieces, some of the stuff, like when I did the Us by Night thing, that was uh, something that took me quite a bit of time to figure out because it 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 has so many layers of transformations. It's not like a simulation or anything. It's essentially a deformer, or a, mm. almost like a character rig for this big structure that is continuously unfolding for two, three minutes. Mm. And the technical challenge of that was something that took me a while to figure out. It's very complicated with like all when you have the entire thing is made of particles and they're but they're not dynamic particles, they're deformed and all the rotations and orientations are they're constrained to each other in a way that when one moves, it's a hierarchy to the entire system so that they kind of have to move along with it. And each particle's orientation is calculated through a stack. It goes through a list of all the previous particles that is lower in its hierarchy. And it was a pure passion project in my mind. I always enjoyed this kind of big, trying to build something that, is, that has an infinite amount of detail, but still works at different scales. Like I'm talking a lot about visual hierarchies here. And I think that's something especially on the GPU that's hard getting something that looks really detailed up close but also looks good from a distance and be making it scalable and, and manageable and it took me a long time I did a lot of explorations prior to that R&D stuff with volumes and growing BDBs and stuff like this and you hit the limit with the RAM when it mm. comes to that stuff but being able to set up these rule sets on particles and on just dealing with translation, scale and rotation, essentially, and managing the system that controls the distribution of different uh, instances, allows you to scale it to a much greater scale. So mm. that was something that definitely took a bit of time. But then other personal projects, I find it easier because you don't have the specific limitations that it, a certain client job might, might have, where you can just channel your inner Whatever comes is and whatever you like, you know, I tend to do a lot of dark stuff and that comes easy to me and I, I enjoy doing it and it's therefore I require less R&D time kind of than if it would have been or less design time because I'm, I decide the rules and what needs to, you know, what ticks boxes needs to be ticked, you know, for a certain design, so. And as a Houdini guru, you probably have a lot of prepared tools in your... Oh yeah, that's the uh, one thing about Houdini, which is amazing. Like I I built, I don't know how many, I probably have about 50, 60 different tools that I use regularly. There, and they all interconnect, you know, so you can use some to generate certain information that another asset can then reuse. And it just scales exponentially the the amount of output you can do once is it something it's something something personalized to you or you, you could sell them it's very well what i have is something we use it obviously uh, under our company we have uh, panoply has their own set of assets as well that we developed um, i have a set of personal ones that i've used and i've developed over the years that is tailored to how i work but you know, I don't think I'm looking to sell them because they're not products as such. They don't have, they're a bit rough around the edges, but they yeah, get yeah. the job done, but they're, you know, they're not 
because a lot of uh, Houdini artists they they are selling their HDAs on Orbolt and oh and yeah stuff like that. Yeah, I know that there are some amazing stuff there. I haven't really looked into too much myself, but one of the things I bought on Orbolt was um, knitting HDAs mm. for stitches for the actual mesh mm -hmm. stitching and all that kind of stuff and haven't made anything with it yet <laughs> yeah that was another thing some of the first stuff I did with it was for Nike and it was well the very first project actually was Hypervenom it's still yeah. one of my favorites it's very dark and gritty uh, but that's one that's from scratch by you I didn't do everything on the project we were team working no no it, I but mean the, but the, the effect yeah. that the, the effect was uh, it w didn't wasn't actually knitting. It was kind of an abstract interpretation of it, a and it, all it w really was was just an, an infection system where lines were drawn and connecting. And it's the same thing that I used on Herodera. That's what I thought. In the base, yeah, it's the exact same system that I developed years prior for for this project. And when I developed it first for uh, Hypervenom, it was it was visual up from the center, whereas in Herodera. It was an underlying structure that then developed, became a surface, you know, for for the glass. So it's it, it, they can be reused and abused in different ways too. And uh, on on the hypervenom, I kind of took advantage of the fact that these are thin lines, and we're feeling we're kind of moving away from it with the camera, and when combined with kind of this rip, this fabric ripple across the surface of this system, it it has enough associations to fabric that it tricks you into thinking that it's just fine or mm. you know a fabric even though technically it's not but with this fine lines and the shadows that area that emerges between them at a distance it looks distinguishable from fabric so it had that nice intersection of you know we have enough things that make you aware that this is a fabric yeah but it's visually different uh, enough to be interesting and it, it was allowed me to show the kind of the, the orange from the other side because the inside of the shoe was orange you kind of have that connection too so it's making those connections and figuring out where your eye to those kind of details is quite unique and allows you to cheat viewers perception whereas me even when I, I, I was a, I'm hugely inspired by many of your works I'm quite literal literal brute forcer hmm. I would try to actually recreate every bloody line well there's no right or wrong way I'm trying to find find a path of least resistance which kind of take in some cases add to it it's like you know you can see a very, a very good illustrator or just, you know artist that can draw very with a feeling it might not have all of the details there that is there in a, in a physical ph photograph or in the physical space but it expresses what it needs to express yeah and it's that again it comes down to the shape here and forms and what's what's important and what's what needs to be front and center and what's secondary cool my audience often asks questions like who inspire you mm -hmm. and things like that for me it's uh, several people you are one of them and uh, to prove I'm not lying, I did mention it in, in my live Q&A's and things like that. So you inspire me as an artist, who inspire you? Yeah, I mean, I get inspired from everyone, from a bunch of people as well and companies. I really like, I really like some of the great, you know, filmmakers and taking inspiration from slightly different uh, slightly different industries than mine. You know, mm -hmm. I'm working within the motion industry and motion graphics. Directors? Directors, yeah. I mean, a big fan of sci-fi movies. Yeah. And, you know, of course. The original <laughs> Alien, it's hard to top. Yeah. And, you know, the Blade Runners out there. And all Star stuff. Wars? I like Star Wars. I can see you're a big fan. I am. Star uh, Wars is the beginning of VFX. Yeah, quite literally. that's true. And I, I, a lot of people I've talked to on various concept art uh, events and stuff, they're always like, Oh, when I saw Star Wars, that's what I knew what I wanted to do in my life and stuff yeah. like that. I don't have a story like that necessarily. For me, when I first started, it was when I started getting into motion, it was because my older brother had a company. Mm -hmm. It was one of the first motion graphics companies back in Sweden. And I got an internship there when I was very young. 
I was like 17, 16, something yeah. like that. And that kind of planted the seed in the back of my mind and that's kind of what inspired me to get going with this stuff. And then it's nature and stuff like this and what we talked about with... But yeah, you asked specifically about artists. I, I like... I don't know, I like to pull information from different sources. I think I can't can't say I have one specific Yeah, no, no one like in that. particular. No, no one in particular. There are of course people I look up to, companies I look up to, a lot of the great, you know, mo I think Tender is really good. I, I like what Corb is doing. I like their style. They have that kind of Yeah, movie. quite similar to you, yeah. you. You are kind of in the same niche. Yeah, I guess so. I think those are two that I think of. But again, I'm I'm trying not to draw inspiration from those sources. I'm trying to boil it down to so boil something down to its essence and then build it, rebuild it mm -hmm. my own way from my own references. When I first joined Manvers Machine, I was fresh out of school. I had very, very limited amount of experience in 3D. I'd only been using Cinema 4D for about three months. Yeah. So I was pretty green when it comes to that stuff. And uh, I learned obviously a lot. <laughs> Going, you know, the first, the first few months of learning is some of your most, when you experience your most amount of growth especially going into a into a prof professional environment you know learning and I got for me it was quite stressful because I always put the bar quite high for myself and I ended up like burning out a little bit in the beginning that's the only way to progress in my opinion mm. yeah I mean it, it worked <laughs> yeah obviously it worked. Um, at the beginning also I was the only one in at members machine using cinema 4d and they were all using Maya, and there was one guy using Max, I think. And uh, yeah, I think that made me look better than I was because I had like the kind of MoGraph tools that were quite hot topic back then, you know. So a lot of the stuff that I could do was quite complicated in the other softwares, and it made me look better than I was. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that's why I got a position there, but but has something to do with it. They pulled you th uh, from Sweden, right? Yeah, I was, yeah, so I started at Hyper Island, which is like a, it's an international school, but it, its origins is in Sweden and back, to, and we were the first year of motion graphics students too. They have other programs there, but we were the first ones that were kind of focusing on motion graphics. Uh, and the entire school was like, it's kind of different. It doesn't have any teachers necessarily teaching anything. It's kind of, you're just learning in a group. Mm -hmm. uh, and working on briefs from people in the industry, so it's quite a unique sort of setup. Yeah. And it's all in English, even though it's in Sweden. There's a lot of international students, and it's all everything happens in English. So it's very common that people can tend to scatter out for their internships and stuff all over the world. Hmm. And I happened to land my internship at Manvi, um, and. It was one of my favorite studios at the time, and so it was like a dream come true at the time. So, in terms of countries, would you want to be in other places like US, for example, or are you happy with the UK? Earlier, I would say I would have been interested in the US, not anymore. Really, yeah. I've kind of lost interest in it. Um, I don't love the UK either, mm -hmm. so I, I don't know. I don't know where I will land in the end. But Spain, maybe. Yeah, I like it. I don't know. I think I, I don't have. I haven't built enough of an. Uh, it, it's nice to visit. I haven't built. A, I, I don't have an idea of how it is to live there mm. in the long term. So. My wife used to live there. Like so, it? Yeah, she wants to go back. I'm not so sure. I like green. Yeah, I, land. I understand what you mean. I mean, I'm from Sweden, so I, 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 we have like very similar kind of climate to here. Yeah, I would say, I, I would say Canada. Canada would be with all the seasons, mountains. Mm. Big fan of snowboarding, so that would yeah. be nice. Yes, please. <laughs> stupid question section. There's no stupid questions. Is it too late for people to try to get into the industry? Absolutely, it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. Forget about it. <laughs> <laughs>
Of course not. No. Um, the, the 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 industry or is changing though. I mean, it's obviously it's never too late. It's just a, a different place now than it was when I started and when you started. And, and I think there are so many subsections of. Oh yeah. It, it does kind of intersect architecture, motion design, uh, VFX, uh, commercials, uh, but they're so different. I have found that I have to explain less what motion graphics is now than I used to do 10 years ago. Yeah, what do you say? I mean, I st now that you put me on the spot, I have no idea, but people do know, <laughs> people do know more about what that is. You, you kind of say uh, animation, design, that sort of thing. Animation, design, motion. I don't. I have no idea. Let's start over. That. I don't know. I'll yeah, that, that, that's what I'm replying. You're right. You're right. It's still hard to explain, but I do feel like it takes few less time now to explain than before. Yeah. Okay. It is more awareness about the stuff than it used to be back in 2008. Yeah. Yeah. That probably was yeah. some wild magic. Stuff. Yeah. Back then, 3D was not common. You know, you, you would as a motion designer, it wasn't obvious that you would do 3D. And that was actually for me, I didn't even want to get into 3D. I think for a long time, motion design as such was related to 2D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing is for me, I, and I didn't want to get into 3D, but what I found was sitting in After Effects, and if, you, if you're not an amazing illustrator or 3D artist or have access to cameras and stuff, you end up making a fancy PowerPoint presentation in the end. Like there's not, you need to have a source for, hmm. for what you're creating in. 3D was the natural progression from that, and Cinema 4D was approachable enough. Uh, yeah, it's really easy, easy to pick and up. I, I still give it credit for that being the only reason why I'm doing 3D now. Interesting. Do you still use After Effects? I haven't, <laughs> I haven't opened it in three, four years. Why? I, it's not because I don't want to. I think it's an okay tool. It's just the work I've done as I needed it. Yeah, you're a nuke. Nuke was in Fusion for a while and then switched to Nuke. And after I switched to Nuke, it was kind of hard to go back, really, to mm. be honest. It was... Is it some specific tools in Nuke you like? I don't... I don't I'm not trying to sell, sell Nuke. No, no, but, I'm just but curious. But I feel like for... I just felt like the overall... The tools that, I, that was there felt robust. And because it didn't feel half I'm, I just did the reverse. I was on Nuke and switched to Fusion. Yeah, so that's, so funny. that's funny. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I, it, what really annoyed me, uh, and I'm sure you're going to say there's a script for that or whatever, but it's the multi XR stuff. Being able to just shuffle out all the AOVs in a fast manner. But in Fusion, you can do it faster. Maybe you can do it faster now. Maybe you, you couldn't then. <laughs> you had to copy the load file. And the only it. thing from my head that would differ in this particular task is that uh, Nuke would reserve the single readout. So it will be same node, reading to multiple exactly. AOVs. Exactly, that's my point. Yeah? That's what I like. And Fusion would have, like, how many passes you have, that would be that many exactly. readouts. Exactly, that's horrible. Yeah? Yeah, mm. that's awful. I, what I do when I work on a, on a video, I set up an, a, tr a network, a composite, and then when I make other shots, I copy that network and I string in the one node, the EXR file, and it spits it up and I can adjust You know it. why I won't go back to the Nuke? Because in Fusion, I split the AVs in one click. That's one. Second, the pricing. Yeah, the pricing and is amazing. And third, the pricing again, because all the no render nodes are free. Mm -hmm. So the, whatever, I'm doing 8K composites in Fusion, and then I distribute it over deadline. And it's like yeah, we actually don't. It's do like ten minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Like we haven't really we exp experimented a little bit with uh, deadline on Nuke, but we just S run it. So simple. that readout argument for me is irrelevant, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's whatever a whatever does the job, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I get that the price is hefty, and we used to be a Nuke Studio as well. Now we're using Resolve for our editing, and. Uh, so that takes down the price a bit. But and now I'm back to indi being indie again. So it just, it's stingy. Yeah, no, for sure. I probably would go back to Fusion. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I like, I like Nuke. I, it's, I don't want to change it. I, 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 I have some specific tools like face tracking and, and features that are exclusive to Nuke. Mm. I mean, they are third party, 
but they only are for a nuke. I do have a feeling that you are probably a better person to talk about this stuff anyway, because you do more with cameras as well, and, yeah. and a lot more VFX heavy composites, whereas all I do is shifting out my AOVs from my C 3D renders, denoise some stuff, color grade, tone map, whatever, mm. you know, so it's quite basic. Put a little vignette on it, <laughs> you know, that sort of stuff. So I use it sparingly, but I do love the ability to split out per light AOVs and, and have control over it. I heard Octane now have like light groups and stuff. Mm. Pro proper it, ones. So in. Octane is funny like that. They, it, they do have AOVs for Paralyte, but all they have is direct and indirect rays. They don't have any... You can't do a diffuse GI refraction. I refraction. think you can now. No. Can oh, you maybe know? you can. Not in the version we're on. I don't know what we're on, but you have direct and indirect I don't know either Paralyte. because I so haven't tested. But this is a big thing for me uh, with Redshift, like yeah. being able to do paralyzed composites and then being able to So I, I had that shot done in Redshift recently. I can't really expl describe it because it would probably disclose stuff. Mm -hmm. But it was basically a storm and there was some lights in there, a lot of lights from many different directions. So I just turned them all on, yeah. rendered in groups, yeah. And then I just animated each uh, group of diffusion, whatever, reflections separately, and it was looking absolutely natural. Yeah, it's you, 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 you wouldn't be able to do it in Octane. You can. I mean, no, not to that level. You have less, mm. you have less control, but you have, because you have the direct and indirect, you at least can take a light source and animate it up and down. Yeah. And the composite, composite will still look natural. It's just you don't have the fine-tuned control of the, all the individual components. Let me remember, what was my issue? I described it in um, my linear workflow tutorial. I think the issue was that the, if, if you isolate light, right, mm -hmm. it doesn't exclude it from main passes, like diffusion. It doesn't yeah. render diffusion light, light one, diffusion light two. It doesn't do groups. I'm not sure, but I, what I do know with Octane, if you try to do a subtractive thing where you take the beauty and subtract a light source, it's not going to add up. Mm. The math doesn't add up this, the way it does in Redshift. So, yeah. Well, I, th I think it's now fixed. I haven't tested we, I don't know. I mean, we might, I'm probably not the right person to talk about this either. And I don't know if we're on the very latest build. Two amateurs sitting here. And yeah, we just. You're doing something ambitious effect you have in mind, right? And you're stuck, you can't overcome it. Mm -hmm. What do you do to solve it? Do you stop or...? or it's, it's helpful to take a step back and, and just reevaluate what's really important, you know, and, and establish your hierarchy of importance of mm -hmm. what needs to happen. Is, are you approaching it the right way? Because chances are you're not. If you're stuck, it's probably because maybe your system is too heavy. Like maybe it's like, it's too slow moving. You can't make decisions fast enough on how, where to put, or you went too far too quick and you put down too many parameters that now it's tweakable and it's the balance of them that is off and that's throwing you off. So mm -hmm. it depends on what task you're in front of, but it takes, it, it, it sometimes helps to start over, clean slate and like start blocking out are you annoyed by that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, 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 but it's the most important thing, like being t time aware, especially when working in Houdini or whatever, where the possibilities are so endless, it's always constantly asking yourself the question, am I doing the most important thing right now? Yeah. I had some projects when uh, you basically did, like, you know, that 80-20 rule? Mm -hmm. I basically did 80% and then 20% of work are taking five times longer than yeah. actual 80% and that mm -hmm. drives me crazy and sometimes I don't know what to do so I just stop yeah. for, for a few days and then I come back and then magically I have a solution to that. I mean it tends to be that way right? Mm. You end up, you're stuck on something and then I find it helpful to kind of attack it in the morning really early okay. like the next day and like with fresh eyes, look at it, yeah. or take a step back. Yeah, basically take yeah. a pause, yeah? Take a pause if you can, but 
sometimes you have to just power through it too and just even if you don't think that your solution is optimal you yeah, just if punch you have a, a if you have a deadline in the morning yeah yeah but regardless it can be a helpful thing to kind of just without criticizing your ev yourself every move you make just take a stab at it whether or not it's not the optimal way or not doesn't matter do it and see where you're going to be in a different place and you're going to have a different perspective okay where you are you can solve that's it. a good one so it, it depends on the situation and what kind of artist are you uh, let's consider houdini tree when you're building out your mm -hmm. tool are you a chaotic dude or you would have a null with all the controls for important I'm parameters. the first kind. <laughs> first. <laughs> the uh, chaotic guy. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, so, and that's something I'm trying to work on. To try to, But it's because I'm trying to work fast. You know, organization can be helpful, but it's also a commitment in time. And a lot of times when you're trying to figure out a technical issue, you end up putting a few nodes aside, trying another approach, and then you might not when I commit to removing them yet or you, you might see some value there that you can then reference down the line yeah. and it ends up becoming a mess and I think I think especially coming from cinema and trying to do this technical stuff there it it, it forces you to work in a messy way almost in order to uh, unless you want to spend a lot of time cashing stuff out because you have you still have the destructive mindset yeah somewhere. it's destructive and you have to copy and reference you yeah, know yeah. you copy your entire setup reference it and then do something to it and then you end up like being really ineffective with your memory usage and everything and and then it's not there's not an overview like you, in Houdini when you have like no node trees and stuff you have like expressor nodes that link to stuff that drive parameters and different effectors and it, everything is hidden away in their own little isolated systems yeah. and it just becomes... Are you at least organizing with under underlays? No. No? <laughs> Colors? Uh, sometimes. Okay. Visually, I have a structure to it. There is a structure to every system. I try to build a, um, a reference point um, that thinks reference. It's like a map where, uh, and this might be a little bit of an abstract construct now to explain, but say on the Herodera thing, for example, we had that kind of surface that has the UV map that constantly references for various attributes. And you have some sort of skeleton that isn't necessarily rendered, but it's informing the other systems or they're informing whatever is built upon it. Mm -hmm. And that becomes your constant reference point. And structurally in your scene file, you will have some sort of kind of layout that makes sense where that's kind of at, at the top where it's constantly being referenced for. Mm -hmm. So that way the mess doesn't build upon more mess. You kind of just extract the skeleton, build some mess on top of it, but it, it doesn't, you don't build upon that mess. You still, when you add more to it, you reference the original. Yeah. So you kind of have a little bit of sanity <laughs> in that level of that kind of work. I don't know if that makes sense with what I'm talking about that. Yeah, it does. You're a chaos maker. Yeah. I know that you're a big fan of small teams and the whole concept of small, mobile, flexible, morphing, changing team. Mm -hmm. As a corporate entity, Panoply, what are your ambitions, visions, and where do you see yourself standing in 10 years? <laughs> 10 years, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I love know. these questions. <laughs> Uh, it's impossible to say, obviously, but our intent is to not grow the company necessarily, but just being, you know, a smaller team, exactly like we are now, and, and just, if we grow it, we grow it very, very slowly and cautiously, not to become bloated, um, just highly efficient, you know, targeted. To avoid unnecessary people, right? To avoid unnecessary people, uh, unnecessary friction, dynamics of all that comes with it, you know, this, this is simplicity to be small. And we like that, you know, we like to be able to be very involved in all aspects of it, yeah. of a production of, of something or designing something. And it's just a purity to it when you're small. You know? I'm a big, big fan of this, big, big fan. And you know, the technology allows us to, if you're small or big, 
even when we worked with Man V, we still had the same amount of people working on any given project. It's just we did more projects at any given time. Mm -hmm. You know, so they still divided, still divide the company into small groups of people. But you need more management and more. You have a new team member from another country. Yes. He's not here. Right? Yes, yes. Uh, his name is Andreas. He's really a uh, really good guy. We we worked with him as a, he was interning for us for six months, and he's starting now this summer full time. Mm. And he's in Austria. So remote work. It's just as if he's in it doesn't matter where he is really. You know, it's within Europe, so like the the latency is not bad, you know. Mm. And I think you could probably work all the way from Russia without really feeling any pain, you know. There are a lot of talented dudes in Russia. They in Poland? Are, yeah. Yep, there is. Poland is quite crazy in terms of... That's true, actually. There's a lot of good talent. How many there. talented dudes are there? Yeah, all of Europe, really. And what are your personal ambitions? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Love this. Yeah, 10 years. Myself, I don't know. I mean, I... Well, you will be an old fart to start with. I'm already old, as I feel old now. Uh, time has... But my goal has remained similar throughout the years. I haven't really changed what I want to do and it still maintains true yeah, but me. But what is it like, I don't know, a, a remote work, uh, super duper simulations, realistic dope work, I just, or something it's more? Hard, it's hard to say, honestly, it's very hard to say. I think I just want to keep doing what I do, honestly. It is a boring answer, but I find that there's no way you can master it fully. Oh and, no. And, you know, keep exploring like, these weird abstractions of our reality is as long as that's interesting to me that's what i'm gonna keep doing and hopefully find commercial clients that appreciate it just as much i mean that's the that's the the end and goal i think for us as a company being able to create that level of work for commercial clients without having to compromise on mm -hmm. you know on the, on the aesthetic and the visuals of it and gaining that trust you know which I think, I believe is possible, and I believe a lot. You can do a very, very exciting toothpaste commercial. <laughs> it doesn't have to be what but, we've seen. But it can. Know. It can be very bad. But, you know, this is my ambition. Mm -hmm. In 10 years' time, we're going to have really pretty toothpaste commercials. I never, did, I never made a toothpaste commercial, but you know what I'm saying. Like yeah, sounds, sounds making amazing. making that stuff. And you know that's a dream. Because yeah, you know it's just it's a lot of artists by... When they get to 40s, they sort of had enough mm. and they prefer to switch to direction, creative direction and th roles like that. Yeah. Supervision. Yeah. Not, sure. not, not you. you. You want to be an executor. Oh, the time. whole point of, of the way we work is that we do that stuff, but we also we're in the trenches too. So it's keeping it manageable within a small team and where everyone is contributing. With what they so you all are di directors. Yeah, we're directing. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, sounds like a really friend friendly environment. Yeah, I mean, most of the work we do is we have to figure out what we're making. It's not just yeah. make this. You know, we tend to not even accept jobs if it's just execution. So, so it's like a concept of no bosses, no employees, as such, but more of a friends and collaborative environment. Except the client is your boss. <laughs> yeah, well, the end, that, that, the end, that's that's, that's the always term. the case. Yeah, so you can, but yeah, the idea is to eliminate as much of the hierarchies that can get in the way of creating good work, right? That's amazing. That's so progressive. Makes sense, right? Yeah, it does. Total and uh, sense. with the remote thing, it just makes it better because it allows everyone to sit in the environment that they feel comfortable with, working the hours they want to work, as long as they get their shit done on time. Yeah and show up for meetings when we have them. It's all fair game. How often do you have meetings? As little as possible. Okay. <laughs> now we, yeah, we tend to I'll talk over, over teams, you know, just um, throughout the day, and then we have maybe check-ins in the morning, so if someone gets stuck, then you can remo share your screen and you can talk through technical issues and stuff like that, whatever it might be. So we have very, we have quite a few of these informal interactions throughout the days, but we, we try to keep meetings to the minimal because for, for the same reason, like people want to be able to 
work in the hours that they can, you know, that they feel more effective. What do you think about crypto art? Crypto art. So this whole NFT stuff, I was kind of, I've started doing a little bit of it now. Okay. Uh, I think it's, for me, it's been fun because it's an, another excuse to just express yourself visually, purely, yeah. and not having a client or having anyone deciding what you're doing. So for me, it's been it's been a good excuse to get back into the Personal the roots. sandbox. Yeah, it's a sandbox in a way. So for me, it's been quite fun, but it is the concept of of what this whole NFT thing is, is still something I wrap my head around and I'm not sure how it's going to affect or change our industry, but it is changing it. It is another way for, for artists to get, you know, get monetize their work, you know, outside of the traditional. Well, you, you know, I like the platforms. So when you buy something on some platforms, they send it to you in a digital screen or something yeah, that I've you plug that and it plays. That's bloody cool, like a hologram. Mm. That's something that could be evolved. I mean, in the future, for sure, they're going to be like, you know, weird. Just, you're going to have like, artif art, what's it called? Not, um, AR, no? Augmented, Augmented reality, reality, yeah. yeah. AR. Augmented reality stuff, you're going to have holographic displays, all of this stuff. It's all going to be part of it, mm. for sure. But the whole, the whole concept of creating a unique kind of you know, original in a digital space is something that is quite new in how, at least for me, in my world. And I think it's... Yeah, it doesn't settle to, settle in the head that easily. No, does because it? like we're used to files being just copied. You can copy it however many times you can. And you can, obviously. Yeah, you still but can. Having, but being able to record something as an original within the digital space is what this has brought to the table. And that's what's changing it up. And I think that that's the art of the future because I don't see us all going back to cave paintings or painting yeah. on canvas I also think to the same so. extent as we have in the past. There's a broader areas to express I think yourself. it will become really interesting once it's past the hypes, uh, hype stage, mm -hmm. you know? When only true, well, not everyone's artist, but... Uh, I don't know how to describe it. I hope you get my feeling. Yeah, no, but there's a, there's a lot of At the noise. moment, it's just hyped, and it's... Mm -hmm. It's a kind of signature look to all of them. They all pretty much. There is, I mean, there's this this same thing with Instagram. Yeah, you know, yeah t trendy topics that are I, rolling there. Yeah, I'm over it. Like that stuff I've been tired of for years. Mm. I think if you're not going to be unique, if you're not going to try to at least express yourself in your own way, something that's true to you instead of mimicking trends. I mean, to me, that's, it's just boring. Yeah. But yeah, it does work and there's a lot of stuff out there in the NFT space that sell that I don't think should have that amount of value and I think we can all agree <laughs> yeah. with that, you know. But yeah, it's a weird world. It's ever changing, but I think it's probably here to stay in some shape or form going forward. And it's a, it changes our industry. And yeah. it's stuff like this and stuff like the GPU explode, you know, renderings all of this stuff, it changes the landscape for us. You have a commercial mm -hmm. you're working on. I know what you're going to say, but in average, how long would it take from A to Z production of the, the level you're, you guys are delivering? Well, it, it, it differs, obviously, depending on the scope of the job and whether, and as I said previously, we don't really take on work that isn't that we, where we don't have a creative input on it. So, but time-wise... Creative input from the client, so... As in where we can kind of steer the concept to okay. respond to the... So the, they might be launching a new product or whatever, and they have a few highlights they want to hit. Uh, and then we would develop a concept that... So it's that fully should, your... Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the kind of work that we do mostly. Yeah. We turn down most of the work that where it's just production. Uh, okay, I see, that's good. So it's a different, it's, the, it's nothing wrong with doing production work, but it's not what we're trying to do. We're so companies are coming to you exclusively for your we're unique vision? Yes. Okay, I, mean, I love that. That's the idea, anyway. And, and it's working out so far. I mean, um, 
it's what we are passionate about. We're passionate about coming up with those solutions and then executing them. Because that's also comparable the, with personal projects when you're exactly. doing it. If you're doing it like that, it's the best result. Exactly. Which is what we've recognized and that's why we're trying to tailor our studio towards that. Can you hire me? I wasn't joking when I said that we're trying to make cool stuff for clients. <laughs> okay. You know, so that's kind of where, where I stand on it, you know. Okay. Can I apply? Yeah, you can. <laughs> Anyone can apply, oh. but we 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 are very careful with scaling. As yeah, as yeah, as well. yeah. I know. I respect that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> when you are doing the prep for the project, mm -hmm. how do you organize your references and stuff? Do you use uh, Trello, Milanote, or OneNote, or just notebook? I very rarely use an output personally. Uh, I use PureRef usually, just pull in references uh, from anywhere. I don't have this. At a service or something. PureRef is a really good application. You can install, you can just drag in references and structure them around on your screen. It's just, you haven't used PureRef? Have you tried Milanode? No. <laughs> No, Look you should there. check out PureRef, it's really good. Um, I will, you promised to check Miller now. Check this out. Oh, it's like a node tree. Right. That's cool. Yeah. I like this. That's my another Miller project. node, you say? Miller node, yeah. Definitely look into it's not it. Not sponsored video, by the way. No. You create bo boards, notes, to-do lists, connect it with lines, mm. stroke it. It's, co it's like a really... It looks probably more capable than ever, than, than really cool. Than what, do, what I'm using it with PRF, but it's enough for what I need usually, and uh, it depends like on the project. We tend to work because we're working as a team within Panoply, obviously, and my business partner he he usually does some of the kind of initial blockouts while I go into the more in, uh, in Houdini actually. Yeah, for example. Yeah, we do all of it, including previous and everything in Houdini. And uh, people have this notion that you can't do this simple stuff like in, cinema, in Houdini, but it's actually really good for it. And there's no difference. Mm. You know, cameras, all of that stuff, blockouts. It's fine. I'm reluctant to switch just because I'm so confident in modeling in Cinema 4D. Yeah. And then recently I've seen some tools, I specifically I'm interested in Blender. Yeah, yeah, Blender seems to be a really powerful that package. That actually sure. could convince me to switch to bloody Blender. Yeah, I believe that. Cinema 4D have less and less points for me to stay. Yeah, I think when I s switched from it, they were the big feature they released that year was the cogwheel. <laughs> I don't know if you remember. <laughs> it's like yeah, a recent big printer. feature they released was uh, Magic Bullet Looks or whatever. Some filters on, on the render. Okay. Yeah, oh, some post effects, basically. Yeah, that seems to be... That's definitely a trend now, too, with like this kind of IPRs with built-in post effects. And it's cool, but... My, con why, my core problem with all these uh, packages is that they are encouraging amateur approaches. That's true. There know, they, they're not promoting artists' evolution. Mm. They're pr promoting like not totally correct or professional approaches to work. There is nothing wrong necessarily with, no. with this, but no. if it's going to stop you from actually taking the time to actually composite the stuff... Yeah, that's what I mean. That's not a good thing, I don't think, either. I yeah. think it can be good as a kind of internal previous, knowing that is you're going to be able to pull off whatever look you need in comp, but... I think this is the yeah. idea that the Maxon did put in it, but it won't be used as this. Yeah. What people forget, when you actually have it rendered and you have it in comp, it's essentially real-time. It's like lighting stuff again Yeah. yeah. For in real-time, where you have full control over each component of oh, the yeah, comp, comp stage so is so much disregarded. I'm actually about mm. to do a video about the, I'll, I'll call it the power, the power of comp. Yeah. And how much difference it does make over your renders. Because the realistic thing, it's mostly not achievable in render, it's achievable in post. Well, mm. at least for the type of shots I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all in post. Yeah. 
it's funny talking about post when you're our post department anyway. <laughs> post and post. Yeah. Do you prefer doing depth of field and motion blur or all that aux auxiliary, auxiliary stuff in post or in 3D? It's obviously better to do it in 3D uh, when possible. And uh, to be honest, it was a, I can't even remember last time we did it yeah. in post. On the, with the exception of a couple of like shots which we knew were going to be problematic if we didn't get it right. But that stuff is quite cheap now. Uh, you know, it doesn't cost that much to render it in. It's just the flexibility you're giving up. But it's really important, obviously, if you have refractive surfaces, as you know. Yeah, and, and that like and that. particles, I guess, <coughs> it's hard to, yeah. to do depth of exactly. with pixel thin stuff. Yeah, and you know, you could do it like I think we, when we've done it in post, we've we've rendered it at a higher resolution and downscale to get rid of some of these difficult. Yeah, yeah. Ed, but it's never perfect. It's so much better to just do the post, isn't it? So, or like in render, in render, if you can. Uh, but then again, we're not doing much compositing with live plates, and so maybe it's having that flexibility there is more. Probably one of the stupid questions. <laughs> uh, you keep saying that. Any tips for the newcomers how to ease the pain of switching to Houdini from a C4D user standpoint? Yeah, I hear you. I mean, it's fun. Think of it as something exciting because it's going to like make your life better <laughs> in yeah. the long term. But um, I would say like what I did was thinking about and I've given you this advice as well, I think. Um, is trying to make sure that you can do the stuff that you need to do on a daily basis. Yeah. So like the, the, the bread and butter stuff, you know, whatever, whatever that means for you. You know, if you're a designer working in, in C4D and you use MoGraph, figure out how you can do those same things. How, how do you animate cameras, you know, with nulls and stuff like that. All that stuff, once you have that in place, then anything else is a bonus. Yeah. So you yeah. just need to replace the fundamentals first, the stuff that you need to be able to do. And once that's there, it's going to be anything else that you add to it is going to like really amp up the quality of your work. Because for me, when I was rea I realized that it was worth it for me when I realized that I needed two three weeks to just solve one effect in cinema, just developing the system, the underlying system to make it work. And that stuff would have taken, you know, a couple of minutes in a dini. And, and, you know, if you end up finding yourself in that situation where oh, this is so hard to do in my current software yeah. that you're going to, you know, that you're going to have to commit a lot of time to make it work and do stuff that it's not meant to do, then, you know, don't waste that time. Don't force it. Like pick a tool that is like suitable for what you actually. But there do. are a lot of not. No, I'll paraphrase. <coughs> I mean, again, I don't know if I'm a prime example of how to use cinema right because I don't think I was using it the right way. I think you were. It does have its limits because you, you're not the only one yeah, like no. hitting that ceiling. Um, for Cinema 4D users, it's always painful because something that took them like two clicks in cinema cloner mog yeah. mograph tools takes like 10 clicks in houdini yeah it goes both ways <laughs> it's yeah. definitely I, I used to think of it like in cinema it goes pretty fast to get pretty far yeah but it's that last bit that takes really long mm -hmm. and in houdini or, or impossible yeah or it's impossible but in, and in houdini it's kind of like it's a little bit slower up front but it doesn't slow down either. It keeps going, and you have the flexibility and and knowing that if a client comes in or or director or whoever wants to change something, you have the ability to do so. There is not as many limitations on what can be done. Okay, that that's a nice way of putting it. It's true as well. Nice. And also the the fact that it's slow from the beginning is true, but after you've done it the first time, you can package whatever you needed to do up in an asset and then. Next time it takes one click. Hmm. Oh yeah, that's true. You just package it up. It, it's a little bit of a, you know, initial commitment, of course, to kind of rewire your brain yeah. to how it works. And you need you you sh you're no longer shielded from the idea of vertices, vectors, normals, and 
you know, you need to understand how to kind of add vectors together and stuff like that for a lot of stuff, which maybe you're not used to thinking that way. Yeah, you definitely have to switch yeah. your logic a little so bit. There's a little bit more of that, but it's all fun, I think. I don't know. I think it is, yeah. yeah. Especially when you start to... See what it can do. Yeah, taste that power you have. And how do you learn this these days? Is it more mostly R&D now or still some online sources? I don't uh, spend much time watching tutorials anymore. Um, I do if there's some like if I have time and if there's something a new area that of, of Houdini that I haven't touched, then I might look at something. But very rarely, it's more trial and error at this point. <laughs> yeah, because uh, testing uh, and I was wondering it. how a pro of your caliber would be developing. There's himself. many areas that I I'm, know nothing about in Houdini. Yeah. And I think it will always be the case for yeah. any level professional. It's like an ab abyss. Yeah. It's impossible to yeah. learn it all, you know. It's very, very deep. But once you learn enough, like once you have kind of a, enough to where you can fulfill what you're trying to achieve with your logical thinking, say you have an idea, if I move this point here and then I record information over to this and load, you start building this kind of ideas in your head. Yeah. And you just need a few tools or a few like fundamental ideas. And then there's a few more that might make it easier to do those things, but at least you get by with these kind of core things. Like if you know VOPs and you have a good understanding of Orbex and you have a good understanding of how you can store attributes and, you know, use for loops, all of this stuff, SOP level for loops are, have made stuff a lot easier. I like for loops. Yeah, they're great. I mean, they, they used to be very very punishing like in terms of speed okay. but now because you can compile them a lot of cases and that can then force them to mold the thread beyond what the actual individual nodes uh, you know they can mold the thread obviously but if you're running over thousands of iterations you're running over groups or name yeah. attributes or whatever that can still get really slow even if you've multi thread because maybe each task is really short in multi threads but it doesn't really go on for that long yeah then with the compiled for loop that will like send it all you know in parallel and they would it would like eat up all your cpu cycles which is perfect which is what you want um another tip i would have is for when it, when that's not when you can't do that is make sure you have enough ram because if you have that you can always run it via tops and then force multiplying that way even if it's you know and and you can run multiple instances of Houdini in the background, basically caching it for you. That's cool. Because you can set in tops, you can set, even if you're just caching locally, you're not using deadline or whatever, you can still set, yeah, I want five tasks at the same, same time per instance. And on deadline, for example, it would then show up as the same machine would show up five times. Mm. And it would just then, you know, for, squeeze every bit of CPU. Yeah, that's one of the strongest sides of Houdini. It can really suck all the juices out of your. Yeah, heart. especially if you like do it that way, where you 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 learn these things like where when it slows down and where it's not fully utilizing the. Yeah. The, but I mean, comparing it to cinema, if we're talking from that, I mean, this night and day, it's like tra time travel. Yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, that's what I felt when I saw you. I was like, oh shit! It's like I've been oh. working. The, Ten years ago, <laughs> or something like nineteen six, nineteen ninety six. That was the first Houdini, I guess. Before that, they had Prisms, which was like for uh, broadcast, like TV, live TV sort of thing, I think. And it was still had a lot of the procedural nature and the kind of fundamental core ideas were mm. already there. Then I learned a little bit about this in retrospect. I haven't, I mm. didn't know about it earlier, but that's interesting. It's pretty cool. You can kind of recognize a lot of the things even tracing back I wonder if they were so good with their initial release was that the logic behind it straight away because cinema as well as Maya and others they are also born in 90s mm. I think they recognized the idea of building systems and recipes you know that, that yeah, can then reusability of assets you know and making sure like I yeah it's a very powerful concept because it allows you to do more with less people. Basically, at the end of the day, it all comes yeah. down to that being more efficient with your time and spending it where you need to, and all of that stuff, all that good stuff.
That's so cool, man. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Well, anyway, it was an absolute blast and a pleasure to meet you in person, mate. Thank you for coming and thank you. Thank you for having me. Spending your time on. <laughs> Spending your time. Sure. So. Ha. Ha. Ooh. What? weird again. Uh, so yeah, my. <laughs> my. Yeah. Sorry, you were funny. Yeah, sorry. That's the point. <laughs> what about money?